Good morning and welcome to Watana Church and we are pleased to have everyone here this morning. Please don't forget to turn off your mobile devices during the worship service. Call to worship from Isaiah chapter 2 verse 3. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go up forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Hymn of Preparation, O Come All Ye Faithful.
A very good morning to all of you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, let us take this moment to confess our sin before the Lord. The word of assurance comes from Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. It says, Come now and let us reason together, say the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as gold. With this word of assurance, shall we all look to God in prayer. Let me pray. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to uncover. Forgive what our lips tremble to names, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from all the past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed, and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and in your image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Shall we turn to, at the back of our bulletin? There is no prayer request on the praise item, but if, if there is anyone to praise our God or for our prayer request, you can take your time. If there is none, but we still believe that when we intercede for our people, for others, God will always do something for others. So let us take this moment to pray for the people in and around the world, for the, those people who are really in need of our prayer support. So let's take this moment to pray. Let's pray. God of everlasting love, you generously provide all the things for us. We pray for your heavenly care for those who are in sorrow, who are in sickness, in the sick bed, discouragement, and any other troubles. Give them the patience and a firm trust in your goodness. Help those who care for them and bring us all into the joy of your salvation. We also pray for your for the Botana Church and churches around the world. Send out a light on the truth of your gospel and bring people everywhere to know and love you. And about those ministers among us to command to command your truth by their examples in teaching, preaching, counseling, exhortations, and in evangelizations. We also pray for the nations, guide with your wisdom and power, the leader of all the nations, so that everyone may live in peace and mutual trust. Lord, give the people of this land a spirit of unselfishness, compassion, and fairness in public and in private life. We commit all this prayer needs under your mighty loving care for all these things we ask through Jesus Christ. Amen. Shall we all say the Lord's Prayer together? Let's pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us from our days. As we forgive our debtors, let us not into temptations, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I, I'm sure that all of you are sitting here just close with your friends, but you haven't wished to one another. I think so. Let us take this moment to greet one another. God bless. When Christmas time approached, we always remember the birth of Jesus, the gifts, the holiday, but do we remember why we are here together in the church and the way God has touched our lives all through the history, all through our own life and how he has helped us. And once again, Christmas time, we ask God to touch his people once again.
comes to us today is from Genesis chapter 15, verses 12 to 18. Read, As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for four hundred years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun has set and darkness has fallen, a smoking firepot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the wadi of Egypt to the great river the Euphrates. 
Now we will listen to a sermon titled God's Covenant by Reverend Dr. Steve Taylor. Good morning, everybody. As we approach Christmas, it's good to remind ourselves why Jesus came to this earth. And so this is really in preparation as we prepare to celebrate his coming. I want to talk about God's covenant. Uh, we know that the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and then the New Covenant. Um, today I want us to think about the covenant because it's really what the Bible is all about. God made a covenant with us. And this is really how we should understand, but very few people really do understand what God has done through his covenant. And before else, I just want to uh, give credit to Tim Keller. Uh, he's a famous preacher, and maybe some of you read some of his works, uh, because I'm indebted to him for some of the outline of this morning's sermon. Uh, every human relationship is based on some form of covenant or our relationship. But most relationships are veering towards uh, what we might call consumer relationships, where we gain benefit from somebody else and then we give benefit back. For instance, if you buy your goods at Tesco, um, then because Tesco gives you a good deal, or Lotus Tesco gives you a good deal on the products that you buy, uh, therefore you, are, you consistently go back to Tesco to buy your goods. But if you find that you can find the same quality of goods at Big C, then maybe you change to Big C. Uh, it's a consumer relationship, and there's nothing wrong with that. But God's relationship with us is not based on consumer relationship. It's based on covenant, where God promises to be all that he is to us and to be faithful to us, even though we may not give him anything back. But God still gives to us. Um, now, in our own lives, the marriage relationship may come the closest to what we may understand as a covenant relationship. For those that are married, remember your marriage vows. Uh, I, and if it's me, I, Steve Taylor, in the presence of God, take you, and then my wife is sitting here, Florida Lisa, uh, to be my wife, to have, to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish as long as we both shall live. Uh, it includes even when things are not going good. I promise to be faithful to you. It's when things are for worse, uh, not just when it's better. It's when things are poor or in sickness. Uh, so when I don't have hair, Flora also promises to me that she will love me just the same. And as maybe I get older, more frail, and uh, my figure is not as good as it was before, but I still, uh, but Flora still promises to be good to me, and it's vice versa. And a relationship that are built on covenant, unconditional covenant love, is the best form of relationship. And it's wonderful when both can feel totally secure that no matter how I am, the other will be faithful to me. And I also, no matter how that person may be, I will be faithful to them. And that's the highest, greatest type of relationship. It's not while you still can satisfy me that I will be faithful to you. Uh, that's not covenant relationship. That's consumer relationship. And the problem will come is if one party is acting from covenant relationship and the other party is acting from consumer relationship. Because in that kind of format, 
the person who is giving unconditional covenant love will always be disadvantaged and taken advantage of by the one who is thinking in terms of consumer. Now in ancient times, when people made a covenant together, invariably there was blood involved. And sometimes they would, uh, two parties coming together in covenant, maybe they would drink some of each other's blood. In Abraham's time, they would cut an animal in half, and both parties making the covenant would walk between the two halves of the animal, as if to say, if I break my word to you, if I break this covenant, may I become like these animals, cut apart. Uh, now God with his people has made several covenants. There's the Adam covenant with Adam, with Noah, with Abraham, and then with Moses, which was with the people of Israel, which was actually built on the covenant with Abraham. And from there we get the Old Covenant. And then there was a covenant with Aaron, with David, and then the New Covenant. And that's a great blessing. And actually, most actually included some conditions within them. And one party may break the covenant. God on his side never has broken a covenant. But man invariably has broken his part, the conditions in concerning the covenant. For instance, in Hosea chapter 6 verse 7, uh, we read like Adam, they had broken the covenant. They were unfaithful to me there. God told Adam to multiply, and to be fruitful, but Adam fell into sin and followed other things, um, broke the covenant with God. And similarly, Israel broke the covenant with God and worshipped other gods and other idols. Um, or else we read in Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 12, where we read, You are standing here in order to enter into a covenant with the Lord your God, a covenant the Lord is making with you this day and sealing with an oath. Carefully follow the terms of this covenant so that you may prosper in everything you do. Make sure there is no man or woman, clan or tribe among you today whose heart turns away from the Lord our God to go and worship the gods of those nations. Make sure there is no root among you that produces such bitter poison. And then we read, The Lord will never be willing to forgive him. His wrath and seal will burn against that man. All the curses written in this book will fall upon him, and the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. This is harsh stuff. And it brings the question, does our relationship with God depend on conditions? Or, as we've written here, is our relationship with God conditional or unconditional? As a covenant God, God says, I will be faithful to you. No matter how you are, I will still be faithful to you. I will never leave or forsake you. In Psalm 27 verse 10 we read, Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me or will never forsake me. And this is covenantal confidence that we can have with God, that no matter how we are, God will be faithful to us. That's our covenantal confidence. And yet, because God is a covenant God, and because God is a holy God, he must also be concerned for his own holiness and his law. He cares about the law. And this is why he says, if you do that, if you break the conditions, I will punish you. It looks contradictory. Uh, so, for instance, we find this verse in Judges. Verse 1 and verse 3 seem to contradict each other. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land that I swore to give to your forefathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land. This was the condition. But you shall break down their altars. Yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? Now, therefore, I tell you that I will not drive out 
uh, drive them out before you. There will be thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a snare to you. So we see that in God's covenant, there's both covenant holiness and covenant love. Both belong to God's covenant. And so again, are the blessings of the covenant of God conditional or unconditional? If we say that they're unconditional, then what about God's holiness? But if we say that they're conditional, what about God's unconditional love to us? That I will bless you whether you're obedient or not. Now we tend to take one or the other. Uh, either we say that it's totally unconditional, and we say no matter what you do, uh, you don't need to worry because God's love will cover everything, and no matter what you do, uh, there'll be no judgment. And we become almost like a liberal Christian. But if we go on the other side and say, well, yes, you'll sin and, and God will forgive you and he will forgive you many times. But in the end, you're going to have to face his judgment. And we take a more fundamental and moralist point of view. And so we come down on the other side. In the end, you're going to have to face God's judgment. Um, actually, in the Bible, we see that the answer is yes. It is unconditional. And yes, it is conditional. It is both. That we see both here in God's covenant. They're both involved. But how then does God resolve this? seeming contradiction within his own covenant, his holiness and his love. And this is the main point that I want us to think about this morning. It's a mystery. Now all the covenants can be brought together into one, what we could call an eternal covenant, even though there are many covenants. We can think in terms of all coming under one umbrella of an eternal covenant, which in Hebrews 13, it talks about the eternal covenant made through his blood. And it's evidence in Acts 2, verse 33, when the Holy Spirit came after Jesus died, and then he rose again, and then he ascended to the right hand of the Father in heaven. He took his blood and presented it to the Father. He was fulfilling the conditions within an eternal covenant that was made within the Godhead between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That Jesus one day would pay the penalty for sin and he would bring his own blood present it to the Father, and in exchange the Father would give the Holy Spirit to those who believed in him. And so we read in Acts 2 verse 33, exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. And this was reflected in, right from the beginning, God's covenant with Adam. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Here we see the first promise that God would, through the seed of the woman, would bring salvation. And this is what we celebrate at Christmas. But also with Abraham, and even more so in Genesis chapter 15, God's covenant with Abraham, some theologians say are the most important verses in the Bible. Because if we can understand what happened between God and Abraham, we will understand what the Bible is all about. So just reading again these verses here. Uh, he also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of uh, the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abraham said, O oh, sovereign Lord, how can I know that I shall gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abraham brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abraham drove them away. 
As the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. And then if we jump to verse 17, a smoking brazier with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, to your descendants I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. This is the Abrahamic covenant which forms the basis of the old covenant. And God uses the symbolism that was traditional in those days when parties made a covenant with each other. Suppose you made a covenant with a king. You would bring these animals and cut them in half. And then to show that you were sincere in your covenant with the king, you would walk between those pieces and as if to say, may I become like the, this animal, may I be cut off, may I be cut to pieces if I do not fulfill my covenant with you, O king. Uh, normally, when it was a king, the king himself would not walk between the pieces. Um, but if the king was particularly gracious, he may also walk between the pieces, showing it was a mutual covenant. And with Abraham, Abraham probably thought that when making this covenant with God, God would require Abraham to walk between the pieces after he brought the animals and laid them all out. But what happened was that darkness fell and God appeared in the form of a, a smoking blazing fire, just like he did at Mount Sinai. And God himself walked between the pieces. As if to say, this is my covenant with you. If I do not fulfill this covenant, may my immortality become mortality. May my light become darkness. May I be cursed if I do not fulfill this covenant. And the important point to see here is that Abraham was not required to pass between the pieces. So it's as if to say that God was taking Abraham's conditions upon himself too. That if Abraham was to fail, God himself would take the responsibility on himself to fulfill the covenant. So even if you, Abraham, fail, I will take responsibility and I will be like these pieces cut off. Now, beloved brothers and sisters, this morning, this is an incredible mystery. It's laid out for us in, in, in a, a, a form here with Abraham that was being fulfilled 2,000 years later when Jesus went to the cross. Because in Mark chapter 15, verses 33 to 34, this actually happened. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As if the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit was torn apart. And Jesus was cut off. And in Psalm 22, which is a prophetic messianic psalm, roaring lions tearing their prey open, open their mouths wide against me. This was seeing the experience of the Messiah, Jesus, upon the cross. And then Paul explains what happened in chapter 3 of Galatians. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through, Jesus, through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. And so here's the answer. Is the blessing of God conditional or unconditional? Well, it's both. But through the cross, God has fulfilled the conditions of his holiness upon the cross. So actually, in effect, for us, for our side, 
it becomes totally unconditional because God himself has fulfilled the conditions and taken upon himself the curse of breaking those conditions. And even though we're in relationship with God, and we will break the covenant almost every day through our sins, but God will forgive us and forgive us and forgive us and forgive us unconditionally. This is a, a wonderful truth. But where does it leave us then? It makes it unconditional for us. But what kind of relationship will we have with God then? Will we become a consumer relationship with God? Because God is unconditional with us and therefore whatever we do, we could take advantage of that. God has made himself vulnerable in the relationship through this. And we could abuse that fact. I just want us to reflect on, as we close, before we pray, the prodigal son. The prodigal son started his relationship with the father. Was it consumer or covenant? Consumer. You know, give me the inheritance. I want to get from you what I can get. He started a totally consumer relationship with the father. And he went off. And the father gave him it all. And he went off and abused that. And he abused the privilege. And he used it all up. Until he came to himself. And then when he returned to the father. The father's relationship with the son was still unconditional. I receive you back. And what was the relationship of the prodigal as he came back? It was unconditional. Treat me as you want. I will serve in your house. I will be. I'm not even worthy to be called your son, but I'm coming back to you. Totally unconditional. Whereas the elder son in that parable never came near to any kind of covenant relationship with the Father. Uh, it was consumer. What I, look what I've done for you. Look what I've done. Uh, uh, there was no understanding of the real and conditional love of the Father. Uh, how are we this morning? And as we come near to the end of this year, we are those that break the covenant. And we break it again and again. As we look back on our lives, there are many things that we're ashamed of. But yet we come to a God who is unconditional in his love for us. He can be that way because he's fulfilled his holiness upon the cross. He himself has been cut off. It's not just an easy, unconditional love, but it was a hard and traumatic, unconditional love. And Jesus came. He came the first Christmas knowing that his destiny was the cross, that he may fulfill God's holiness through him and fulfill the eternal covenant with the Father, bringing his blood back and the Father would give his Holy Spirit to us who believe in him. So let's pray and just take a moment, pause to reflect on these wonderful truths. Ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate them to our hearts. And that our relationship with our Father will be liberated into that freedom of being sons. Yet sons who unconditionally give back to Him all that he is worth. Our Father, we thank you that you're a covenant God. You've made your covenant with us. And you've fulfilled the terms of the covenant upon the cross. That you may love us unconditionally. Father, we pray that we would not abuse from our side of the relationship, 
that give ourselves unconditionally to you day by day, not taking lightly sin. But we thank you for sending Jesus to fulfill and bring us back into relationship with you as we should be. Thank you, Lord, this morning for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide, the tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil, of the firstborn of your herds and your flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. From Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 22 to 23. This is offering time, and we will also sing a hymn while sitting down. Thank you. 